Good morning. Yes, yes. That's how we want this morning to go. Very cheerful. I suppose uh, you've been having a very good uh, time here in Michigan so far. So uh, the smiles, the good mornings, and all the cheers should be so obvious. Anyway, I wanted to uh, welcome you to this, uh, what we will call here at STEM Africa and Michigan, the second phase of our four-day conference. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, on Tuesday, these long four days are sort of a mixture of what we would normally call our STEM conference, where we discuss our regular thematic areas, biological sciences, mathematics, chemical uh, engineering, and all the allied uh, subjects. But we merged it this year with a particular look at the diasporas, at the US, uh, at the African STEM diasporas in the US. And again, uh, the interest in that subject came from uh, our engagements that we've been having, I mean, us as STEM Africa in Michigan, with our various African colleagues that we've met, particularly the African Union. Uh, the former Commissioner for Human Resources, Science and Technology for the, uh, for the Union, Professor Jean-Pierre Rezen, he's a good friend of ours, a long time uh, partner in our STEM activities. In one of our engagements, he uh, asked us about the African diasporas in the US, the scientific diasporas. The African Union is creating its uh, uh, Pan-African University Institute. And uh, like all the other STEM centers of excellence that have been created on the continent, the conversation keeps going back to who would teach, where are your human resources to man all these centers. And more and more, the attention gets turned towards the diasporas. The conversation about the, about the, brain, grain, uh, the, the brain drain. Is it brain drain or brain circulation? The diaspora sometimes have problems with their governments back home about going back. How do we integrate ourselves back in the community? There's that desire to work together, but then mechanisms or interfaces between the, the diasporas and the African partners hasn't been very solid. In so many ways, the interest in the diasporas comes because not only are we the brains outside, we are, when I say we, I mean the African diasporas, about w the strongest economic force on the continent from afar. In terms of all of Africa's constituencies abroad, we have the closest social proximity to the continent. Our families, our extensions are all still there. So we still breathe and feel Africa in so many ways. But around the STEM co conference, we thought, instead of looking at the diaspora question very broadly, immigration, remittances, social uh, issues, governance. Maybe due to our specialty, we should look at the STEM diasporas uniquely. Just look at them as a community, those in US higher education. Look at their demographics and their particularities. They have their own characteristics that are different from any other subset of the diasporas. And so this second phase of the conference is to help look at that second phase. Just start taking a peek at it. So we've uh, tried to align quite a few sessions that, in our, that within our resources we could, uh, we could, we could afford. You look on your, car, on your program, we have a keynote this morning that would get us started on that conversation. We have panels that will review some of the works of select diasporas, uh, African STEM diasporas in the US. There's surely too many of them. A question once came to me during one of our conversations in our, with our African colleagues. Somebody said very sarcastically, who keep hearing diasporas, diasporas, where are they? You see, the, all the meetings that we attend in Africa, all the uh, policy meetings, research meetings, we don't see many diasporas. We see maybe two or three show up all the time. We don't see all of them. Diasporas, where are they? And so the session after this on exemplars was to make the case that they exist and they're doing great work in the US. And after that, the session that would follow on networks is still to show that they exist. And with or without some partners, they are already on their own volition doing some great works and organizing themselves to support development in Africa. 
And uh, later sessions tomorrow would we'll look at science diplomacy. More and more, science diplomacy is taking center stage on international relations. And in that arena, the diaspora serves as a bridge between nations. Uh, the U.S. government is very interested in the diasporas to serve as ambassadors to their home countries. Science happens to be the language that everybody speaks, regardless of background and interest. So, science happens to be a language that bridges many divides without any, um, uh, without, uh, without uh, preconditions, pretty much. And so uh, there will be, be sessions tomorrow on the, diaspora, on, on the diasporas and science diplomacy. There will be a session on what kind of institutions in the U.S. and in Africa can be partners in harnessing the diaspora potential for Africa. What are those institutions? Is it the African Union? Is it the governments? Is it the National Academy of Science? Is it U of M, Michigan here? Who are the partners and who, what resources can enable the diasporas to effectively play a role in African development in, in STEM fields? So these two days are dedicated to that broad conversation. It's just a kickoff in a conversation that would take a long, long time because Africa is embracing science and technology as a new phenomenon since its independence. And so, given how policies are going towards science and technology development, one can very safely say the next 50 years of Africa would probably center pretty much on its brain power outside and how they can contribute to science development on the continent. And so Michigan is proud to be at the center of that conversation to start off by posing the questions, bringing the diaspora together. It so happens that we could only have so many panels, only so many people could speak. So uh, even though our panels have only so many speakers, we recognize that the good number that's here today, or that was here yesterday or the day before yesterday, are all diasporas in a way. And so we, we invite you to contribute to that conversation, enrich it, and let's leave some traces of what others who think about the diaspora's conversation can look and say, well, Michigan was already there talking about it, and some few guys championed it at the beginning. So. Uh, Again, one of my forces is that I'm a teacher, and I, can, and I can keep talking. But I would hold it there, and again, welcome you to this morning's session. I will now invite uh, the young lady you met on, uh, first, uh, on Tuesday morning. I call her young lady very, very, uh, um, uh, very confidently, because her role at the African Studies Center has been the role of a young person, a person who is very young at heart, who is very enthusiastic, very visionary, who doesn't look at the past and think of the glories that they've achieved, but keep looking at what they can do. That's how youthful thinking does. You have a future to live to, to imagine, and that's how she imagines STEM coming into being. Let me welcome again our director, Kelly Askew. Thank you, and Kim, um, and thank you all for being here today. It is my great pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce a longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Paul Tiambe Zeleza, who's currently the Vice President of Academic Affairs and Professor of History at Quinnipiac University in Connecticut. He's also past president of the African Studies Association, and I had the pleasure of serving as a board member at the time that, of his presidency, so we have long-time working relations. Um, I also just want to support what Kim says, that we're very pleased to have this opportunity at the University of Michigan to host these set of conversations that will hopefully continue to grow and grow in terms of how we can um, harness the powers and talents and skills of the diaspora for the betterment of science globally, not just for the betterment of science in Africa, but that there can be global contributions out of these connections. And Dr. Zaleza has been working a lot on issues of diaspora. His academic work has crossed traditional boundaries ranging from economic and intellectual history to human rights, gender studies, and diaspora studies. Of course, the topic for today. He has published more than 300 journal articles, book chapters, reviews, short stories, and online essays. And he has authored or edited 27 books. So for the mathematicians in the audience, please help me figure out what is that output per day? You know, that, I just want to just have some sense of what I need to aspire to. Um, several of his books have won international awards, including Africa's most prestigious book, pri book prize, the Noma Award, for his books entitled A Modern Economic History of Africa in 1993, and topic for us also concerning um, manufacturing, 
although it's manufacturing African studies and crises, so manufacturing in another sense, intellectual manuf manufacturing. His most recent books include In Search of African Diasporas, Testimonies and Encounters, published in 2012, and Africa's Resurgence, Domestic, Global, and Diaspora Transformations, which is due out this year. He has presented well over 250 keynote addresses, papers, and public lectures um, in over 31 countries, serves on the editorial boards of more than two dozen journals and book series, and has his own online publication called the Zaleza Post, which um, ran from 2004 to 2012. He's worked as a consultant for the Ford and MacArthur Foundations, as, as an advisor to the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. His research project on the African Afri academic diaspora conducted for the Carnegie Corporation of New York in 2011-12 led to the establishment of the Carnegie African Diaspora's Fellows Program, just launched last year which will sponsor up to 100 African-born academics here in the U.S. to work with African universities back home. So perfect um, background for what we're talking about today, and I'm sure we have a lot to learn in the coming 45 minutes to an hour. Thank you, Paul, for joining us, and please wel join me in welcoming Paul Zaleza. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you, Kelly, for that absolutely wonderful and generous introduction. And thanks to Ken for inviting me here. Uh, you can tell my voice I'm a little, you know, suffering from some uh, flu because of the change of weather. Uh, uh, and when my assistant said, are you still going to travel to Michigan in this condition? I said, absolutely. And the reason is because I do believe very strongly that this is a very important uh, conference dealing with extremely important issues uh, for all of us. So I'm very pleased to be here uh, this morning. I've entitled my presentation as the development of STEM in Africa, tapping the potential of the diaspora. African, Africa's modern history has been uh, driven by three interrelated quests for self-determination, development, and democratization, for the construction of inclusive and sustainable developmental democratic states and societies. Central to this enduring process and project are edu uh, education, science, and technology, the development of robust and innovative knowledge systems through increased investments in tertiary education and research and development in general and in the STEM fields more specifically. Thus, education, science, and technology have long been seen as vehicles for Africa's social, economic, uh, polit and political transformation for restructuring and reimagining the continent's engagement with the world. Ultimately, this is a search for African modernities in a world dominated by instrumental reason and characterized by the growing importance of knowledge economies and knowledge societies. It is a project that poses challenges that are simultaneously political and philosophical, concrete and conceptual, about the social and structural conditions and imperatives of Africa's development in a world that rewards scientific and technological progress and punishes those lagging behind. Clearly, knowledge, including science and its applied products, technology, are driven and conditioned by powerful epistemic, economic, political, and historical forces. Science is as much a scholarly venture spawned by intellectual curiosities and opportunities as it is a social enterprise sustained by ideological interests, institutional dynamics, and the demands of society for solutions to pressing challenges and the market for profitable products. Science thrives as much through the motivations, inspirations, and aspirations of the scientists themselves as it requires structured support provided by universities, governments, businesses, and other organizations. Like other knowledge uh, systems, science operates under national and transnational epistemological and regulatory regimes that transcend its internal disciplinary proclivities and the agency and ambitions of its practitioners. 
The pressures and opportunities for strengthening science and technology in Africa have risen in recent years as prospects for economic growth, political liberalization, and struggles for social inclusion have accelerated. And as the imperatives of knowledge and innovation of science as a major productive force in global competitiveness have become more evident. As apparent in the proliferation of national, regional, and continental science and technology policies and plans, African governments are more aware and if it seem more committed than ever for their countries to become producers of scientific knowledges, not just consumers of technological products, by increasing investments in higher education and in the STEM fields. While science and technology are of course not a panacea for all the challenges of human and social development, uh, and by themselves will not solve Africa's stubborn legacies of underdevelopment. Without them, they cannot be solved. My presentation is divided into three parts. First, I'll briefly discuss the global context of trends in science, technology, and innovation in Africa. No, not surprisingly, Africa lags behind on such key indicators as the gross domestic expenditure on research and development, the number of researchers, and in the share of scientific publications and patents. This is the impetus I will explore in the second part of the presentation behind various efforts undertaken in recent years by governments, international agencies, and universities to create a more enabling environment for the development of education, science, and technology. Finally, I will examine the role of Africa's academic diaspora in the process of Africa, Africa's scientific regeneration. This will include a brief discussion of the project I conducted that Kelly mentioned in 2011 and 12 for the Carnegie Corporation of New York on, quote, engagements between African diaspora academics in the U.S. and Canada and African institutions of higher education, perspectives from North America and Africa, and of quote, out of which the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellows Program was recently established. So first of all, Africa in the world of science, technology, and innovation. The modern world is unimaginable without science, technology, and the innumerable innovations that have revolutionized all aspects of social life, from health to the environment to communication. Ever since the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, the links between science and technology have become tighter. There has hardly been any significant technological advancement since the beginning of the 20th century that has not been the byproduct of scientific research. The relationship between science and technology is, of course, not unilinear. There are multiple feedback loops between the two, and between them and markets and national uh, 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 economic and, and social well-being. Investment in research and development has become inc an increasingly critical factor and measure of national competitiveness in a globalized economy compressed and interconnected by informational and communication technologies. There have been vigorous efforts to collect and improve the quality of data on science, technology, and innovation. In 1999, UNESCO held the World Conference on Science that brought together one of the largest gatherings ever held to discuss and make a new commitment uh, on science in the 21st century to quote the title of the conference report. Subsequently, the UNESCO Institute for Statistics, UIS, began refining and systematizing data collection monitoring and measurement on science and technology from more than 200 countries. It was particularly concerned about the challenges of compiled STI data in developing countries with their weak statistical systems, including how to capture R&D uh, in indigenous knowledge systems, research by international and foreign controlled entities, measure the R&D component of clinical trials, software development, reverse engineering, and minor technical adaptations, development research, and social sciences and humanities research. Nevertheless, trends in the global knowledge economy are quite clear. Four major ones can be identified. First, while the United States and Europe continue to be dominant, Asia has risen to become a major player and other major emerging economies have increased investment in their knowledge systems. However, large parts of Africa and Latin America remain relatively marginal. The rise of the major emerging economies such as the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, BRIC, 
Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Korea, or MINT, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey. You know, people keep inventing these terminologies. Um, reflect the shifting terrain of the global economy, reinforced by the Great Recession, which wreaked more havoc on the developed than the developing countries. To quote one report, in 1973, about two-thirds of the nearly 400,000 research publications indexed by Thomson Reuters Web of No uh, uh, had an author in one of the uh, G7 countries. Today, this has changed dramatically. Four times as many documents, more than 1.7 million uh, journal publications are being indexed, and barely half will have a G7 author. The volume of publications with at least one G7 author may have trebled over that period, but the volume on which no G7 countries represented has gone up sixfold. End of quote. Second, research in science and technology has become internationalized. In the words of an, an NSF report, and I quote, collaborative research is becoming the norm, and collaboration across national boundaries is generally increasing, as reflected in the international co-authorship uh, on research articles. In 1988, only 8% of the world's S and E science and engineering articles had international co-authors. By 2009, this share had grown to 23%. For the world's major s and regions, the, the 2009 rate jumped from 27% to 42%, end of quote. One result of this is that citations to international work have noticeably increased as well. Third, the landscape of R&D funding is changing as new players enter the scene. Previously, governments dominated followed by universities and businesses. Historically, business expenditure in R&T was confined to the developed countries. It is growing in the major emerging economies. For example, in China, BERT grew from 59.96% of, uh, of total uh, GERD in 2000 to 74.4%. in 2010 and in Brazil, from 44.73% uh, to 47.88% uh, during the same period. Also growing is investment in R&D across the world by knowledge and technology intensive firms. Major new sources of R&D expenditure include foundations and non-government organizations. The impact, for example, of the Gates Foundation on global health research is quite remarkable. Finally, the growth of digital technologies, including broadband, internet, and mobile phones, has had significant economic, social, political, and cultural impacts and opportunities. In the 19, um, it, uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, afforded developing countries uh, almost unprecedented te uh, technological leapfrogging opportunities. In the 1990s, the statement that, quote, there, was, there, were, there are more telephone lines in Manhattan, New York, than in sub-Saharan Africa, end of quote, achieved dubious distinction as a testament to Africa's underdevelopment. From 2008 to 2013, Africa became the fastest growing mobile market in the world, boasting a growth rate of 18% per annum signaling the shift, uh, the, shift uh, the continent's shifting economic and technological fortunes. I have a, a series of tables that obviously I'm not going to show, but I'll make references uh, to them. And I have a table uh, which shows, uh, you know, patterns of gross domestic expenditure on research and development and, uh, uh, around the world. And in that table, uh, which I can make available uh, for those interested in the talk, it can be seen that Asia's rise, in which Japan is now joined by China, India, and South Korea, has been at the expense of North America and Europe, which have seen their share of gross domestic expenditure uh, fall. Um, in, in R&D, that is. Uh, North America's share uh, of, of world uh, uh, gross um, expenditures in R&D fell from 37.7% in 2002 to 32.7% in 2009, and Europe's from 30% to 28.5%, while that of Asia rose from 27 to 33%. In the meantime, Latin America's share rose marginally from 28 
percent to 3.1 percent, while Africa's remained stagnant at 0.9 percent. A similar pattern is evident when we examine the world share of researchers by region. Again, I have a table that indicates North America's fell from 25.2 percent to 22.7 percent in 2009. And Europe's rose uh, from uh, Europe's sorry fell from 32.2 percent to 31.1 percent, while Asia's rose from 35.2 to 38.2 percent during the same period. While Latin America saw its position uh, rise from 3 to 3.8 percent, uh, while Africa's actually fell from 2.2 percent to 2.1 percent. Although the volume of publications rose in all world regions between 2002 and 2008, as again shown in another table, the rate of growth was fastest outside North America and Europe, so that the latter's proportion declined from 34.2% to 31.1%, and um, for Europe, 455 to 42.5 respectively, while of course Asia uh, rose its share from 24 to 30.7%, Latin America from 3.8 to 4%, and Africa uh, from 1.6 to 3.4%. Clearly, Africa remains at the bottom of the global science, technology, and innovation league tables. Within the continent itself, there are strong discrepancies between North Africa, South Africa, and the rest of the continent, as evident from these tables that uh, I've made reference to. Regional discrepancies are also quite pronounced in other uh, parts of the world, including Europe, between and within the European Union, the Commonwealth of Independent States, and in Asia between Japan, China, Israel, and India on the one hand, and the Commonwealth of uh, Independent States in Asia, newly industrialized economies in Asia, and Arab states in Asia. The dominance of North Africa and South Africa in African GERD is clear from the fact that in 2002, the two accounted for 32.9% and 35.7% uh, respectively of GERD expenditures. By 2009, South Africa's share had actually risen to 43.5%, while that of North Africa fell to 31.4%. South Africa's GRD per capita of $95 in 2009 was higher than the $68 uh, uh, dollars in Latin America and the Caribbean, slightly below Asia's $104. Um, and, uh, you know, the country's, you know, uh, GERD of 0.9% uh, of the country's GDP up from 0.7% uh, in 2002 uh, was in contrast uh, to the rest of the continent. For example, in North Africa, it fell from 0.4 to 0.3, and for the rest of the continent, it remained stagnant at 0.3. North Africa... Um, share in the total number of also uh, researchers, uh, you know, was, was fairly large, as is that of South Africa and so on and so forth. By 2009, uh, you know, uh, South Africa had increased its share of the continent's uh, researchers to 13.5%, um, while that of North Africa had slightly do, uh, dropped. As for publications, the fastest growth between 2002 and 2008, uh, again, uh, that, uh, you're looking at the data, that was uh, experienced, uh, the fastest was experienced in the countries outside North America, uh, sorry, outside of uh, North Africa and South Africa, um, but the two uh, continued to be uh, dominant. Altogether, however, uh, by 2008, Africa accounted for a, uh, a miserly uh, 2% uh, percent of world publications, up from 1.4% in 2000, the same figure as in 1991. During the same period, Latin America had increased its share of world publications from 1.8% uh, to 3.3% uh, uh, in 2000 and 4.9% uh, in 2008. Asia, of course, recorded the most remarkable growth, rising from 16.2% in 1991, 22.5% uh, in 2000, and 30.7% uh, in 2008. 
Again, I have another table which uh, looks at the fields of uh, the major fields of scientific publications uh, in the different uh, world regions. For the world at large, in 2008, the leading fields were in this order clinical medicine, engineering and technology, biomedical research, physics, chemistry, biology, earth and space, and mathematics. A similar order can be seen uh, for North America, except that biomedical research swapped places with engineering and technology. Uh, in Asia, the order is led by clinical medicine, engineering and technology, chemistry, physics, biomedical research, biology, earth and space, and mathematics. For Africa, the three leading fields are clinical medicine, biology, and biomedical research, followed by chemistry, engineering, and technology, physics, earth and space, and mathematics. Not surprisingly, Africa's share of patents granted by the US Patent Office, the European Patent Office, and the Japanese Patent Office in 2000 was a negligible 0.1%, the same as in 1991. By 2007, the situation had not changed much. Um, and again, I have a table uh, which shows the patents around the world, including uh, uh, for Africa's uh, you know, various countries. 92, uh, there were in 2007, 134 patents uh, that Africa got. Um, 92 of these patents were registered uh, by South Africans. Um, who also accounted for the bulk of those registered with the triadic uh, patents of uh, the three uh, patent organizations. Uh, and the rest of the continent only accounted for 16 registered in the US Patent Office and three of triadic uh, patents. In the meantime, Asia's share, again, shows remarkable uh, growth from 28.4% to 32.1% uh, 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 for the U.S. patents and uh, for the triadic patents, 27 uh, to 32%. Africa's performance in the adoption of new digital technologies is a lot more impressive, which underscores the potential of the knowledge economy and society for the continent. The global, uh, the global growth uh, of digital technologies has been phenomenal. According to the 2013 annual report of the International Telecommunications Union, an estimated 2.7 billion people, representing 39% of the world's population, were expected to be using the internet by the end of 2013. As for mobile phones, there were expected to be 6.8 billion mobile cellular subscriptions, almost as many as there are people on the planet, estimated at 7.1 billion to quote the ITU report. Also spectac spectacular has been the growth of mobile broadband. ITU estimated that by the end of 2013, there were two billion mobile broadband subscriptions, a figure that is expected to reach a staggering 6.8 billion in 2018. Again, I have a table that shows the regional distribution of uh, some of the key ICT indicators. In every world region, not only have mobile cellular subscriptions overtaken fixed line subscriptions, the number for the latter are generally falling. The dramatic growth of cellular phone subscriptions in Africa is evident from the fact that by the end of 2013, there were 545 million subscribers in sub-Saharan Africa alone accounting for 63.5% of the population, up from 87 million in 2005, or 12.4% of the total population of the region. From 2008 to 2013, Africa became the fastest growing mobile market in the world, boasting a growth rate of 18% per annum. In, in, in 2012, the, mob, uh, the mobile industry contributed 6.3% of Africa's GDP, or 60 billion, which was projected to grow to 119 billion, or 8.2% by 2020. Quote, this is well ahead of comparable figures in other parts of the world, for example, of 1.4% in Asia Pacific and 4% in Latin America. 
In addition, the industry already supports over 3.3 million jobs across sub-Saharan Africa while contributing um, uh, $21 billion to public funding through taxation in 2012. End of quote from the ITU report. Excuse me. As for internet uh, penetration, it ranged from a high of 75% in Europe to a low of 16% in Africa, half of Asia's rate of 32%. Nevertheless, it is important to note that the level of internet penetration was as low as 2.5% in 2005. Altogether, only 41% of the world's households were connected to the internet by the end of 2013. Africa's rate of internet household penetration has been growing the fastest in the world, at an annual rate of 27% since 2009. The pace is likely to accelerate through the growing use of, uh, of mobile cellular as a platform for internet connectivity, given the much higher levels of mobile penetration. The growth of mobile broadband around the world has been remarkable in recent years. It grew from 268 million subscriptions in 2007 to 2.1 billion uh, in 2013. Within, uh, within uh, uh, these years, uh, Africa's mobile broadband grew from uh, 1.8 uh, to 10.9%. Uh, 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 Thus, the digital gap between regions has been narrowing. Although huge challenges remain for Africa and many other developing countries, levels of internet penetration tend to reflect levels of internet infrastructure development and pricing structures. Predictably, internet adoption is concentrated in urban areas and is determined by levels uh, of income and education as well as the household characteristics of gender, age, and social networks. In general, Internet costs are much higher in Africa than elsewhere in the world. While in Europe, the price of a computer-based plan with one gigabyte of data, uh, data volume represents on average uh, of uh, less than 2% of monthly GNI per capita. In Africa, it represents an average, on average um, of, of more than 50% of GNI, uh, gross national income per capita. Among the developing countries, costs average 30% of GNI per capita. Globally, the cost of fixed broadband ser services dropped by a remarkable 82% in the preceding five years up to 2013. Researchers have sought to identify the economic, social, political, and political implications of internet uh, access, adoption, and utilization in Africa. It is widely believed and there is increasing evidence to demonstrate the beneficial effects of investment in ICT on social and economic growth and development. To quote Stork at all, mobile telephony adoption court generates employment opportunities in the sector and improves the productivity of other sectors as it combine, uh, contributes to business expansion, uh, to entrepreneurship, to banking the unbanked, and to reduce trans, uh, transaction costs. Investment in telecommunication infrastructure has a direct and indirect effect on economic growth, end of quote. The World Bank has gone so far as to claim, quote, that in low and middle income countries, every 10 percentage point uh, increase in broadband penetration accelerates economic growth by 1.38 percent uh, percentage points, end of quote. Second part of my presentation, engineering Africa's fu scientific future. African countries have become increasingly committed to strengthening their STI capacities as a critical driver for sustainable development, democratization, and self-determination. We, of course, uh, on, uh, know only too well that intentions do not always translate into reality. And African governments and international agencies are notorious for their fondness for flowery declarations, plans, and strategies that are often uh, unveiled with great relish only to gather the bureaucratic dust of inactivity until the next flavor of development rhetoric. By 2010, 
more than 40 countries had established ministries responsible for national SCNT uh, policies. In addition, several regional agencies were created to promote development and coordination of SNT policies, such as the Network of African Science Academies, uh, formed in 2001, which by 2010 had 15 national members, including several uh, established, of course, before this period. Perhaps the most ambitious initiative was the adoption of the Africa Science and Technology Consolidated uh, pl uh, uh, Plan of Action, CPA, in 2005. CPA emerged, uh, emerged rather the science and technology, pro, uh, technology programs of the African Union Commission and the new partnership for Africa's development NEPAD. It sought to promote the integration of Africa into the global economy and the eradication of poverty through five priority clusters, biodiversity, biotechnology, and indigenous knowledge. Second, energy, water, and decertification. Third, materials, sciences, manufacturing, laser and post-harvest technologies. Fourth, information and communication technologies. And finally, mathematical sciences. The plan outlines strategies for improving policy conditions and building innovation mechanisms through the creation of the African Science, Technology and uh, Innovation Initiative to establish common STI indicators and an STI observatory, as well as strengthening regional cooperation in science and technology, building public understanding of science and technology, a common st uh, strategy for biotechnology and science and technology policy capacity, and promoting the creation of technology parks. The plan concluded with a list of institutional and funding arrangements, as well as overall uh, uh, governance structures needed to ensure um, its effective and efficient uh, implementation. The CPA received vigorous support from UNESCO, which selected areas for support and proceeded to help a number of countries to review and reformulate their science policies. In 2008 and 9 alone, uh, UNESCO worked with 18 countries to do that. Through its Institute for Statistics and in cooperation with the African Union Commission and NEPAD, it held regular regional workshops and training sessions on the relevance uh, of um, S S uh, S uh, science and technology statistics. Notwithstanding all the fanfare that greeted the adoption of CPA, progress in implementing its programs proved slow. In the meantime, other regional initiatives were established, including the Knowledge, Manage, uh, the Knowledge Management Africa, formed by the Development Bank of Southern Africa uh, in 2005, uh, to improve governance and service delivery in Africa through the creation, to quote the report, sh uh, sh uh, the creation, sharing, and dis uh, dissemination, and utilization of knowledge, end of quote, by enc encouraging partnerships between universities and research institutes. NEPAD itself established a number of flagship projects, including the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, the African Laser Center, and the Southern African Network for Biosciences. There is now sizable literature produced by both national and international agencies and scholars on the capacity constraints and challenges facing African countries in building robust systems of science and technology. Four key issues are often identified. First, at the policy level, the need to base science policy on the technological and industrial needs of society and integrating it into national development plans as well as providing adequate and stable funding for implementation is of uh, stressed. Second, the massive expansion of the size and support for this higher education si uh, sector is seen as imperative. Third, incentivizing the business sector to invest in research and development by itself and through in the industry university collaborations is encouraged. Fourth, promoting scientific literacy is valorized as a critical means of popularizing science, technology, and innovation in society and among students at all levels of the educational system. It stands to reason that developing and executing effective s policies entails the mobilization, 
of key stakeholders, including public institutions, the private sector, universities and research institutions, uh, international agencies, non-governmental and civil society organizations, and the media, which is, is indispensable for translating science to the public and building popular support for it. In short, if the goal is to promote science and technology for sustainable development, the processes of policy form formation and implementation require democratic engagement. This calls for political will and bold and visionary leadership, strong institutions, and strategic planning and coordination of programs and activities into a single, strong, and sustainable innovation system. Without providing adequate resources to build research infrastructures and capacities, national plans become mo uh, nothing more than ritualistic rhetorical gestures to fantasy. During the lost decades of the 1980s and 1990s, African universities entered a period of profound crisis, characterized by plummeting faculty pay and morale, which forced many to search for greener pastures at home and abroad, including people like myself. Deteriorating teaching facilities, dilapidated um, uh, uh, labs and stuff like that. Uh, they also um, suffered from, you know, grave imbalances in enrollments uh, by gender, class, and region, fragmented and inadequately funded research programs, overly authoritarian leadership and bureaucratic practices, excessive political interference, and propensity to strikes by students, staff, and, and faculty, lack of national and inter-regional collaboration among institutions and poor linkages between universities and industry and society. Some of these challenges persist in several countries, but investments in higher education and knowledge production have generally risen from the lows of the 1980s and 1990s. Increased support was reflected in the rapid growth, or has been reflected in the rapid growth of public universities and the private higher education sector the creation of, or improvement of accreditation standards, the expansion of digital and other infrastructures, the establishment of student scholarship systems and national research networks and universities. For example, by 2010, Nigeria had 104 um, approved universities, uh, of which 27 were federal, 36 state, and 41 uh, private. In Cameroon, the government tripled the salary, uh, the salary of academics uh, in, in, in 2008-9, uh, and this led to a noticeable court rise in the number of scientific uh, um, uh, articles produced by the state universities, end of court. One effect of growing mass demand and support for higher education by the public and private sectors, families and international financial and philanthropic agencies uh, has been the explosion in enrollments. As again, I have a long table uh, which shows uh, global enrollments in universities. Um, and for Africa, between 2000 and, uh, and 2005, uh, you know, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa's growth uh, was, was, was the highest, had the highest regional growth uh, uh, in the world at 10% compared to the world average of 4.2%. Altogether, enrollment almost doubled uh, between 2000 and, uh, 2000 and 2007 from 2.3 million uh, in 2000 to 4.1 million in 2007. Female enrollment in tertiary institutions in Africa rose from 32% in 1990 to 40% in 2007, although Africa's gender parity index remained, of course, lower than the world average. Similarly, Sub-Saharan Africa's gross enrollment ratio remained low at 6% uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa in 2007. STEM disciplines increasingly benefited from the establishment of universities of science and technology, the growth of these programs in other universities, and the growth of national and international research institutions um, in various parts of the continent. In Cameroon, for example, enrollment in S&T uh, fields rose from 90,000 in 2000 to 150,000 in 2010. 
In Senegal, the National Academy of Science and Technology, founded in 1999, adopted a program for the development of science teaching and the National Agency for Applied Science, created in 2008, embarked on the establishment of a science park focused on ICTs, biotechnology, uh, the, government, the garment industry, and aquaculture. In Mali, the government set up 18 national research institutes coordinated by the National Center for Scientific and Technological Research, established in 2004. In Rwanda, the government announced in 2007 that in a few years it had boosted expenditure on S&T from less than 0.5% of GDP to 1.6% uh, and it planned uh, to raise this to 3% of GDP by 2012, which if it happened would be higher than the world averages. Africa's leading economies, Nigeria, South Africa and Egypt, launched ambitious programs and initiatives to promote science and technology. Nigeria's Vision 2020 embraced science and technology as a national priority and identified 12 key areas for systematic intervention and development, including biotechnology, nanotechnology, renewable energy, space research, knowledge-intensive new and advanced materials, ICT, and traditional medicine, and indigenous knowledge. By 2010, the country had caught about 66 R&D institutes covering various sectors of the economy. R&D in many of these institutes had, ha, has produced a host of nationally patented innovations, end of quote. In South Africa, the government adopted the National Research and Development Strategy in 2002, which sought to promote a coordinated science system, increased investment in R&D to 1% of GDP, and enhance the country's innovation and competitiveness in the global knowledge economy. The government established a research chairs initiative, centers of excellence program, and a postdoctoral fellows program. In 2010, the Department of Science and Technology adopted a 10-year uh, innovation plan uh, building on the 2002 plan uh, that uh, placed emphasis on South Africa becoming a world leader in biotechnology and pharmaceuticals, space science and technology, energy security, global climate change science, and human and social dynamics. To promote these activities, an innovation fund was established. It cannot be overemphasized that the African STI and R&D landscape uh, are highly differentiated as evident uh, in the, uh, what I talked about earlier in terms of levels of growth, investment, and so on and so forth mobilizing the diaspora for Africa's science and technology revolution. I would like to end uh, with brief remarks on how we can mobilize the diaspora. Often missing in the prescriptions for the promotion of science and technology is the role of the diaspora. The role that the diaspora can and is already playing. The academic diaspora should be seen as an integral part of, the, of, Africa's, of Africa's global stock of human capital, critical for knowledge production and flows, the development of effective transnational research networks, and technology transfer. African governments and institutions, on the one hand, and the academic diaspora, on the other, should promote mutually reinforcing and virtuous cycles of engagement and collaboration. In 2011 and 12, excuse me, as I mentioned at the beginning, I conducted a research project for the Carnegie Corporation of New York um, on this issue. Out of the project, earlier this year, the Carnegie African Fellows Program was established. As Kelly noted in the introduction, it will provide 100 African-born scholars currently based in the United States and Canada, together with a host in, uh, universities in Africa, opportunities to collaborate in three areas. Teaching and curriculum, research, and graduate training and mentoring over the next two years. 
I will briefly share the findings from the research to underscore the changes, challenges, and opportunities that mutually beneficial engagements between the diaspora and Africa can bring in the production, circulation, and consumption of scholarly and scientific knowledges and advance the frontiers of science, technology, and innovation in, for, and with Africa. The project brought to, together two streams of research and advocacy that separately have expanded rapidly in recent years. One is the work on the role of the diaspora in international politics and development. The other is the internationalization of higher education. In the first instance, diasporas from the south, located in the north, are increasingly seen as potential assets for the development, democratization, reconstruction, and globalization of their home countries. The growing valorization of diaspora engagement and mainstreaming is captured in the shift of metaphors used to describe skilled labor migration from brain drain to brain gain to brain circulation. For its part, internationalization has emerged as one of the defining issues of higher education. A growing number of colleges and universities around the world loudly proclaim their commitment to internationalization in the names of academic excellence and institutional competitiveness. In its findings, the project sought to identify and explain the nature, dynamics, uh, forms, and challenges of engagements between African-born academics in Canada and the United States and African institutions of higher education on the continent. These engagements in their current forms and trajectory are quite complex, often contradictory, and subject to continuous change. This is because the processes of diaspora formation and higher education internationalization are likely to shift in the face of transformations in the global, regional, and national political economies in which the diasporas and the universities operate. Time, of course, does not allow for an extended discourse on African diasporas. Suffice it to say, one can broadly distinguish between historical diasporas formed out of long histories of dispersal out of Africa over the last few centuries and the new diasporas comprised of African-born uh, immigrants and their offspring. In the project and in this presentation, I focus on the latter, who constitute the latest wave of diaspora formation. Research shows that while the bulk of the continent's migrants go to other African countries, many of them as refugees, African migrations to the global north, including the United States and Canada, have grown rapidly in recent decades. The latter are made up predominantly of highly educated migrants. Indeed, African-born residents uh, enjoy some of the highest levels of education of any population in the United States and Canada. The African-born academic diaspora in Canada and the United States constitute the sharp edge uh, of Africa's unusually high rates of skilled migration, the highest in the world for a region with the lowest stock of skilled workers in the world. Not surprisingly, serious concerns have been raised about the effects of such massive brain drain. The academic and policy literature underscore both the developmental pitfalls and possibilities of these phenomena. And we need to examine more systematically uh, or with uh, reference to academics. The African-born population in Canada reached 401,500 uh, in 2006. This represented 6% of the foreign-born population in the country, which in turn comprised about 21% 20, uh, uh, of the country's uh, total um, uh, foreign-born population. Altogether, only 34.2% of the African-born immigrants in Canada in 2006 had come before 1991. So you can see the bulk 
30.4% uh, came in the period 1991 to 2000 and 29.4% in the period uh, 2001 to 2006. So the massive migration of those lost decades of the 1980s and 1990s. The African immigrants compare favorably with the native-born and other foreign pop uh, uh, populations in that country in the areas of educational attainment, labor force participation, but less so in levels of unemployment and uh, income. And I have a lot of data uh, in the report that shows that. Data from Statistics Canada on invest employment acquired specifically for the project um, showed that there were uh, about, uh, in 2008, about 300 African-born academics employed as full-time faculty in Canada's 124 universities and colleges. Of course, there are a lot of others employed in other capacities. They mainly came from Egypt, Nigeria, Tunisia, South Africa, Kenya, Cameroon, Zimbabwe, Ghana, Mali, Morocco, Rwanda, Algeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Tanzania, Senegal, Congo, Madagascar, DRC, and Benin. And I have data which shows what they were doing, you know, and that kind of stuff. In terms of gender distribution, the vast majority were men. In the United States, both the African-born population in general and the academic diaspora in particular are, of course, much larger. In 2010, the foreign-born population totaled in this country overall 40 million, which accounted for 12.9% of the total U.S. population. African-born immigrants within these 40 million of the foreign-born immigrants accounted for 1.6 million, or 4% of the total foreign-born population. Only 9.1% of the African-born population uh, had come before 1980. 12.9% came between 1980 and 1989. 26.5% came from 1990 to 1999. And 51.5% have come since 2000. Since 2000, then, the rate of immigration from Africa into the United States has surpassed any other world region. In terms of levels of education and labor force participation, the African-born immigrants are, ex you know, is, is, you know the, the, uh, their levels are exceptionally high. Uh, while 57%, for example, of the total population in the United States and 59.3% uh, of the native-born population had post-secondary education, the figure for the African-born residents was 68%. In terms of those holding bachelor's degrees or higher, the African-born were only second to the Asian-born at 40.3% having bachelor's degrees the, uh, with the Asian-born 48.5% respectively, compared to 28.4% for uh, the native-born Americans and 27% for all foreign-born immigrants. Uh, and 11.2%, uh, for example, for Latin Americans. In the 2000 census, Africans, uh, the African-born population actually had the highest levels of education uh, um, of any population in the country, including the Asian-born. Uh, this, of course, has, has slipped, and there are very interesting reasons behind that which we don't have to go into. Find, uh, finding recent and reliable data on the size of the African-born academic diaspora in the United States uh, employed in American universities and colleges proved quite challenging. Using various sources, I estimate that there are currently between 20,000 and 25,000 African-born academics uh, working as faculty in American colleges and universities, in excluding those employed as staff and administrators. There are also many academics and researchers from Africa working public, private, and non uh, the, the, the non-profit sectors. From, the ex uh, from an extensive review of the existing literature on academic diaspora networks in general, and the more limited studies on the international engagements of the African academic diaspora, and more crucially, uh, the in-depth uh, interviews that were conducted for the project with 105 African-born academics in Canada and the United States, several generalizations can be made. First, it is clear that many of these academics do or seek to actively engage African institutions of higher education, but are often hampered by various obstacles rooted in their social and institutional contexts and in the conditions of African universities. Second, for the engagements to be effective 
unsustainable, there is need to develop organizational infrastructures that minimize the challenges and maximize the uh, maximize mutual benefits for African academics uh, in both regions. Third, it is critical to promote engagements that are multifaceted, innovative, and attuned to the massive transformations taking place in contemporary systems of higher education and the complex landscape of internationalization in higher education. The professional biographies of the academics interviewed for the project clearly indicate that diaspora academics have complex transnational trajectories. Almost invariably, they were educated and have worked in different countries in Africa, Western Europe, and North America. Thus, they enjoy extensive networks that can be tapped to globalize African institutions and knowledges. Many of them expressed strong interest in establishing robust relationships with African universities, either in their countries of origin or elsewhere on the continent. But they operate in contexts in which they do not always have much control. The contexts include the prevailing perceptions of Africa and Africans, African universities by Canadian and US universities and the changing dynamics of the academic system which manifest themselves in many ways, including the growing financial challenges facing the higher education sector uh, in this country. So those of us who are administrators are confronting those issues on a daily basis. Three contexts in particular stand out. The first, the impact of the tenure track system and career trajectories. Second, the role of gender. And third, the impact of processes and patterns of diasporization. Notwithstanding the shifting and challenging contexts, the benefits of engagement are widely appreciated for effective professional and ideological reasons. The effective motivations include the sense of guilt, obligation, and responsibility, and a quest for well-being. The language used by many of the interviewees is revealing. They want to give back, to contribute, and help Africa develop, they said. Many derived levels of professional and intellectual satisfaction they found missing in their current jobs. For those whose research depend on collaboration with colleagues or maintain transnational households, engagement provides further personal opportunities and benefits. For most diaspora academics, engagements with African institutions arise out of their personal relationships, often through colleagues uh, they went to school or worked with on the continent or abroad. Others benefit from contacts of people they met at conferences, whether in Africa or North America and elsewhere. Social media is also an avenue through which some relationships have been established and maintained. Excuse me. Diaspora networks can play an important role in facilitating engagements. Diaspora engagements with African universities take various forms from, uh, from those organized around uh, the three dimensions of the academic enterprise, namely teaching, uh, scholarship, and service. Thus, we can fruitfully isolate the activities that seek to promote teaching through student exchanges and study abroad programs, so short courses and summer classes, curriculum development, and supervision of graduate student dissertations. Second, activities through which diaspora academics foster scholarship and professional academics, uh, activities rather, in African institutions, including joint research uh, uh, and uh, grants, publishing, and manuscript reviews, donations of books, uh, journals, and equipment, building databases and digital archives, performance evaluations for promotion cases, and as external examiners and mentoring. Third, diaspora academics sometimes help augment national development capacities through consultancies. For higher education, more specifically, there are numerous examples of diaspora academics establishing or providing critical leadership for higher education institutions and network, networks, including centers, institutes, foundations, and universities. As for the modalities, engagements are often effected through physical visits and conferences, faculty appointments, and sabbaticals, and online and virtual connections. Also, diaspora academics are increasingly good at leveraging 
their own institutions, foundations, and international agencies in support of connections and capacity development in African universities. The multiplicity of diaspora engagements, even for individual academics, cannot be overemphasized. In the sciences, I was struck by the wonderful work being done by scholars like Wole Seboyeje, who was here, a professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering at Princeton University who chairs the scientific committee that advises the Nelson Mandela institutions on establishing new centers of science and technology in Africa. And he also was involved in the establishment of the U.S. African Materials Institute, an exchange program that has sponsored more than 100 visits by African scientists to leading um, American engineering schools. Moreover, he's the founder of the African Renaissance Institute of Science and Technology, um, which seeks to strengthen African science and technology education at existing universities and institutions of higher education through programs that would promote world-class education, research, entrepreneurship, and innovation, end of quote. Another scientist, Neil Turok, a South African-born physicist who serves as director of the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Canada founded the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences in 2003 as a collaborative venture between several elite South African, British, and French, uh, French universities. It offers a master's degree and postgraduate certificate in mathematics. Another AIMS center was established in Abuja in 2007, Dakar in 2010, uh, followed by Accra, um, and Addis Ababa. With $20 million in funding from the Canadian government, Turok established the next Einstein Initiative with the goal of establishing an additional 15 institutes across Africa by 2020. Travel is, of course, the most effective way through which contacts between the diaspora, academics, and their African colleagues are established and maintained. And of course, as we know, many African uh, scholars here spend sabbaticals at African universities and so on and so forth. Others hold joint appointments uh, with African universities. Virtual and online modes of engagement are also growing. Diaspora academics are sometimes able to support African institutions by leveraging resources, as I indicated, from their own institutions, foundations, and national and international agencies. Uh, several of them expressed pride uh, for bringing African students to their institutions for graduate training. For many diaspora academics, engagement with Africa, their, con uh, their connections are often multinational, multi-institutional, and sometimes even multi-sector. Significant, uh, significant challenges remain in sustaining these relationships. I will isolate five. First, lack of in, uh, lack or inadequate administrative and financial support on both sides. Second, rank and gender imbalances in accessing resources and opportunities for internationalization and engagement. Third, attitudinal obstacles, including what many diaspora academics regard as unrealistic expectations and negative perceptions by African institutions and academics on the continent. Fourth, hurdles arising from differences in academic systems. And finally, questions of citizenship and patterns of diasporization can loom large. Understanding the circumstances, perspectives, and challenges faced by the diaspora is not enough if the dreams of turning the academic diaspora into a significant partner for the development of African higher education is to, uh, uh, to be realized. It is imperative to comprehend as clearly and concretely as possible the institutional context, capacities, composition, and motivations of institutions and academics on the continent in order to establish effective and sustainable strategies and initiatives of engagement between the two communities. It is only by aligning and synergizing the professional and the institutional interests of academics and universities in North America and Africa that the full potential of African diaspora engagements can be realized. The studies that were conducted for this project in Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa for their respective regions uh, echoed many of the issues and challenges observed among African-born diaspora academics in, Canad uh, in Canadian and American universities. Most pertinent is the lack of clearly articulated institutional policies among African universities to engage the diaspora. Relationships with the diaspora largely tend to be informal 
and individualized and often diaspora driven. Nevertheless, the research revealed considerable appreciation of the potential benefits of engaging the, diaspora, the academic diaspora in North America and elsewhere. For these benefits to be fully realized, there is need for African institutions to be more proactive, for them to develop more structured programs of partnership and maximize both their interests and those of the academic diaspora. In conclusion, despite the underdevelopment of diaspora engagement uh, strategies in African universities, the three studies that were conducted on the continent for this project underscore the fact that important shifts have taken place at the continental and national levels uh, in official attitudes towards the diaspora uh, as well as uh, other forms of engagement internationally. Increasingly aware of the negative developmental impact of the massive brain drain they have uh, that they have suffered in recent decades and fueled by the transformative effects of democratization and economic ref reform, as well as keen to harness the opportunities of globalization and remittances, the diaspora is no longer dismissed as a lost cause at best and a horde uh, of national traitors at worst by African states, businesses, and civil society leaders. Instead, it is regarded as a potentially powerful locomotive whose human, financial, social, and cultural capitals can be mobilized and help drive the development of the continent and their respective countries uh, of origin. Emblematic of this shift in perspective is the designation by the African Union of the diaspora as the continent's uh, sixth region. The challenge is to put this into effect. The Clearly, engagements between African institutions of higher education and the diaspora academics are, are, are typically the result of individual initiatives. More often than not, they emanate from self-sponsored visit home, uh, home or to conferences by the diaspora during which they may be invited to local universities, either by former colleagues or by students that trained in Canada or the United States. For institutions and academics based on the continent, engaging the African academic diaspora in Canada and the United States holds benefits and challenges. The benefits include at the national level, reversing the brain drain and potentially turning it into brain gain and bro brain mobility to use the, uh, the analytical metaphors of our time. Thank you. Don't go away. <laughs> that was one thorough, comprehensive, sweeping talk. <laughs> I think we got everything we could possibly want out of our understandings of what the relationship is, could be, challenges, etc., and benefits for engaging the African diaspora in the betterment and improvement of African science, technology, and innovation. Um, we do have time for questions. So let me go ahead and start fielding some questions. Yes, sir. Working? Is it working? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul, for your characteristically, characteristically, characteristically comprehensive uh, survey of the project, uh, of, the, of the subject. Uh, there are, I've got two questions. The first one is a question of database. Uh, for us who want to engage with the diaspora, uh, we really have a problem identifying who is where and who has what qualifications. Uh, I'm speaking, for instance, in, on behalf of the Ethiopian Academy of Sciences, which has been really grappling with this idea of who, are, who, are, who is where. Uh, so how do we overcome this question of establishing the database of the respective national diaspora one? The second question is, uh, this project, uh, this, uh, or the Carnegie project, is really a very worthwhile and commendable project. But uh, what can be done on the other side? Because at the end of the day, the beneficiaries are there. Uh, uh, do we have to depend always on external uh, funding, external assistance, and so on? There are some things that have to be done to facilitate this. I mean, um, accommodation, mm -hmm. uh, customs, all. There are so many problems that people face. When yesterday we had a very interesting presentation on the question of on the problem of customs, how you have to overcome. What can national governments and also the regional organizations that you mentioned, African Union, do? to reciprocate these gestures that comes from the, from the north 
Uh, it's not enough to designate the diaspora of the fifth or the sixth uh, uh, region. Uh, what practical measures, uh, we have the representative of the AU here, what practical measures can the AU take uh, to actually uh, meet the, or, uh, such organizations as Carnegie kind of midway or halfway? Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Barrow, for those uh, wo uh, uh, wonderful questions. Uh, the issue of databases is, is a serious one. Uh, in fact, part of the project uh, is seeking to develop a comprehensive database uh, of African-born uh, academics in Canada and the United States. And uh, we, we, we are in the process of trying to do that in a number of ways. Um, we are collecting uh, data from you know, a whole range of institutions, uh, including the U.S. Department of Education, uh, you know, national agencies for, you know, na national associations for universities, um, you know, uh, uh, national associations for, you know, particular disciplines, um, the African Studies Association, so you name it. It's, it's going to be, a, 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 you know, it's a very uh, labor-intensive task. Uh, and also, we're going to build a database of all the applications that we receive. Uh, you know, some, of course, will be awarded. Some may not be awarded. So, we, you know, data building, uh, better, uh, database building is a very important part of this project because if we do that, then it becomes easier on uh, both here to identify people who can be tapped into uh, as well as, of course, to help institutions on the continent to know who to tap into. In terms in terms of the structure of the uh, program, the Carnegie program for uh, the African Diaspora Fellows program, the way it's structured is precisely to maximize that possibility. Oh, on the African side of it, the applications have to come from institutions, from universities. And the universities have to, um, of course, the person can be suggested by some, you know, somebody in a department, but the institution has to buy into that uh, through you know, indicating that they will provide some support uh, in terms of accommodation, in terms of office space. Uh, you know, the point is that if there is no institutional support, there is no point to have engagement. So um, it's also a way of making sure that faculty are not doing it on their own. They're, they have the institutional support. But uh, you know, once they suggest the areas they are interested in, uh, we have created uh, the application platform whereby the institutions in Africa indicate the areas they're interested in, in having faculty to engage with. Um, whether it's a teaching, you know, research, or whatever it is. And on this end, the people who are applying uh, are indicating, of course, the areas they're interested in, and there is a matching that is taking place. Uh, uh, so the more robust the data system uh, gets, the, the more effective and productive those kinds of uh, matching uh, will, will, uh, uh, will be. As to what African institutions can do, uh, one is what I've already said, by African universities uh, through the uh, application mechanisms already have to demonstrate uh, interest and support uh, for, for, for this. Uh, but beyond that, it's, it's important for uh, national uh, university systems, associations, uh, regional associations, and so on, uh, to develop uh, policies on engaging the diaspora. Uh, we looked at all the you know, existing policies across Africa with regards to internationalization uh, for, for universities, both at an institutional level, at, at sort of an associational level, uh, uh, in terms of association of universities, but also at a national level. And very few universities, in fact, hardly any, had specific policies uh, on the diaspora. So part of it is for them to develop, as part of their internationalization, uh, you know, policies uh, and systems that, that uh, uh, track the diaspora. Because the diaspora has is, is, is got a different way of engaging Africa from other people. So the way you deal with them, uh, you, you know, we're not just a remittance pipeline, you know, that in this case, academic remittance pipeline, as it were. Uh, you know, we have emotive and other complicated emotional relationships with, with the continent. And sometimes the way you are treated uh, you know, it matters in ways that uh, for other people may not matter uh, in the same way. The, so policy level is important. Uh, the, the other thing that uh, is, is also critical is, you know, for, for the, these governments, uh, regional, uh, you know, gr groupings and so on to engage directly with uh, groups like this one, 
that we have created. Uh, again, the tendency is to mediate relationships through official channels, which is understandable, and of course that's important, and that will continue government to government, the embassies here, and so on and so forth. But it's also important when it comes to higher education to identify groups that are engaged in higher education. In this case, a group like ours, we have established an advisory council that you know sets policies and that advisory council is constituted by academics in this country as well as academics uh, in this country and canada as well as academics in on the continent um, Professor Adeshida, for example, who is provost at the University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign, is a member of the council and is one of this country's leading uh, in, uh, in, engineers, a uh, brilliant, brilliant engineer. Um, and, and then on the African side, we have also very prominent people in the sciences and so on as part of the advisory council. So engaging a group like ours and the other groups uh, becomes a way of maximizing and leveraging uh, the kinds of relationships with regards to academics and in, in, in specific uh, cases uh, when it comes to STEM. In fact, uh, we'll be holding our conferences. Our next uh, you know, meeting of the Advisory Council is in Nairobi at, at, at the beginning of next month, where we are inviting uh, a number of academic, uh, national, and regional associations of universities, uh, uh, research networks, uh, you know, embassies in, in, in that region, and others to have a dialogue with us. And there's going to be a major conference, I gather, of African leaders, you know, the AU is involved in that on higher education. It's important for those meetings to include uh, diaspora communities uh, in whatever iteration they come because we are on the ground, we know exactly what's going on, and we know how to navigate the systems here in order to engage most productively with African institutions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your, I'm over here. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Um, it was very informative and uh, gave you know very clear perspective on the uh, latest uh, um, situation of African diasporans. I uh, I wanted to ask if you could comment a little bit on the fact that many of the African diasporans are themselves citizens of the U.S., citizens of Canada, or of you know their their um, resident countries in Europe, mm -hmm. and how that provides an extra opportunity um, to lobby their, um, host, uh, their, their government mm -hmm. to raise the vis visibility of what these, you know, 20 to 25,000 um, faculty are capable of doing, uh, for example, in the U.S. So if you could comment a little bit about how we can uh, use our uh, citizenship mm -hmm. status mm -hmm. to lobby the U.S. government, Congress, um, and also um, as a way to tap into our countries of origins embassies from this end mm -hmm. and sort of bring the dialogue together at that level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. In fact, you, you've provided, I think, an excellent uh, set of suggestions which, which uh, demonstrate the, uh, the advantages of people taking citizenship. Uh, one of it is, is obviously that if you're a citizen, you have the right to vote, so you can vote. And politicians, uh, all they really care about is, is elections. When, when everything is you know, uh, factored in, it's, it's all about elections. And if you want to have any lobbying capacity, uh, if you are not organized um, and you don't vote as a community, you are not going to affect, uh, you know, members of Congress, you're not going to uh, not affect even the uh, executive branch of the U.S. government. Um, in fact, uh, you know, I and a colleague uh, have a book coming out this year, um, the colleague happens to be my wife, but we, we talk of each other's colleagues when it comes to academics, uh, you know, on U.S.-Africa relations. 
and uh, it looks at the role uh, of, of different aspects of foreign policy making. And one of the areas that we look at is, is the role of the diaspora in, in, in U.S. Uh, foreign policy making, both in terms of the historic diaspora, the African American uh, community, as well as, of course, the new, uh, the new migrants. With regards to the new migrants, they are, they are, you know, they are pockets in which they are concentrated. They are beginning to have effects because of their citizenship status in the Maryland, Baltimore, D.C. area, for example. You can go talk to Cummings. Uh, and he will listen to you because he knows that you vote. In Houston, you can begin talking to the Congress people in Houston because there is a large Nigerian co community there. So it's not just about Africa, it will be about Nigeria. Uh, so th it becomes important from that angle. But I even in professional terms, uh, one of the things we found out in the study is that um, for academics who are not uh, quote unquote uh, citizens, they have difficulties accessing some national resources. I'll just give one example. They cannot access, for example, Fulbright uh, fellowships uh, because those are you know, confined to, uh, uh, to, to citizens. The other thing is also your opportunities for getting employment uh, within the U.S. higher educational system to, you know, can be compromised by that. And if you are not employed or you, you are uh, an adjunct, it becomes very difficult for you to have those relationships as robustly as you might wish. So there are professional uh, imperatives that lead some people to do that. Now, at one time, you might uh, recall a lot of African governments and, 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 and uh, uh, institutions and, and even colleagues on the continent will say, you know, why would you become a citizen of Canada or the United States or Britain or France if you're an African? That's, you know, betraying uh, the continent. But I think that discourse has shifted, realizing that people becoming citizens does not reduce their emotive, their economic, their social, their cultural, their political commitments and engagements with their countries. In fact, they become freer to exercise that in ways that do not compromise their professional and personal well-being in terms of uh, things that might matter to them. So it is important uh, for, for uh, people to realize that being a citizen doesn't, you know, is not, is not betraying, uh, you know, uh, 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 the continent. Of course, for a lot of diasporans, including myself, it takes a long time to get to that emotional, psychic moment to say, <clears throat> for me, it took me over 20 years because I couldn't quite fathom. You know, eventually I did, but. Okay. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions. Maybe we'll take a series of questions and then have yeah. you try to. Okay. Who has the. No. Yeah, okay. I, I have the mic. Okay. Oh, whoever has the mic. Who, who's I, I have the mic. I have the oh. mic. Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay. So, uh, thank you very much, um, Paul, for that brilliant um, um, exposition. But I, I think um, when it comes to the issue of diasporans, one thing is that we have to realize that if the country the institutions, establishments back in Africa were to be good, they will not become diasporans. And therefore, I think beyond Carnegie, diasporans should themselves begin to think about how to support their various countries. You come together in a very strong group and find a way of supporting um, your countries. Otherwise, we begin to be asking about reparation, mm -hmm. you know, because it's, it's, it's very, very important. Most of us have been trained back at home um, before coming here. And so you should, if you gain a lot in U.S. or in Canada, you should be also be willing to have a formative group that will contribute effectively either at the level of education. In, in politics, you can be a formative group, you know, to correct most of the misdeeds that are going on in most of the countries. The corruption and all the, and the bad leadership we're having, you could be a, a strong group to correct most of the things that are happening in uh, the countries back at home. Thank you very much. Very quickly, if you can be very quick, Beatrice and then you can. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd, I, I want to say something because there was a question asked concerning the African Union, but let me also uh, express appreciation for the for, for the excellent presentation. Um, let me just say w one of the challenges that uh, Africa has in uh, in operationalizing the diaspora as the sixth African region is defining diaspora, mm -hmm. and it's good that you mentioned the you know the spread of diaspora. Really, I mean they've been coming out here since the last what several hundred years, centuries leaving Africa and all that, but you, you chose to focus on, on, on what you referred to as the African-born ones and their offspring. But very soon their offspring, their offspring are already out there and ready to, you know, to participate as diaspora in, in Africa. So we, we do need a definition of, of diaspora. What AU is doing, we, we do have a directorate uh, that deals with issues of diaspora, but I agree we need to do more to really operationalize this relationship. Um, there, there, there's also an African Institute for Remittances, although remittances are not the only thing we want from diaspora. In education, we say really remittances are not going to, to staff our universities. We, we, we need the brains, we need the professors, we, we need brain circulation, as has already been mentioned. But just having that Institute for Remittances also recognizes the challenges that diaspora have in, in, in one of the aspects of their giving back or doing something with Africa because we know that th th there's, there's a challenge when it comes to sending money through formal um, channels back home and this institute is, is going to take care of that. And we do have mechanisms for, for involving diaspora. The Pan-African University, as I mentioned, diaspora is, is, is an integral part of, of the, you know, the, 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 the fishing ground, if you like. For, for professors for the Pan-African University. We are developing brain circulation program, but also the new science and technology strategy. You mentioned the CPA, but there's now the STISA, Strategy for Science, Technology, and Innovation in Africa. Uh, they, they do consider, we, we do consider diaspora as part of, um, you know, the, 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 the brains. Calestas Juma is one diaspora who's always been involved in our science initiatives. So we, we are aware of the thematic and geographic associations uh, of diaspora, but we need a coordinating body so that we, are, we, you know, we have a one-stop shop right. of accessing right. diaspora. So the, the, the initiative that you mentioned really is appreciated by the AU, but we need to do more concerning it. So just kind of uh, similar to her, his quest, uh, her question, and I think what the Stan is trying to ask also. The issue of diaspora, the AU defines diaspora as uh, everybody of African descent outside of uh, Africa. But even we here in this meeting, we, we found ourselves looking at diaspora as the African-born diaspora. Look at the crowd of diaspora that are in here. But then the numbers, 20 to, uh, to 25,000, that's small when you look at the African-American diaspora. Mm -hmm. So can you comment upon the, upon your work, why you chose to do the African born, or how to <coughs> revise that, that, that conversation. Because if 1% or 5% respond of that 20, 25,000 response to Africa, how many are that for the continent? Mm -hmm. As opposed to already the continent defining its own diaspora in the most broader terms, mm -hmm. but when we operationalize it, we look at those who have more sh shorter terms. Look at how the, uh, the, the Du Bois and the Pan-Africanism came out of here, part of the Negritude came out of here. The diaspora that developed and freed Africa from slavery, mm -hmm. from uh, colonialism, was the uh, American diaspora. Right. But then they have been put out of a picture in, in this mm -hmm. conversation when mm -hmm. we operationalize it. So how do you comment on that? Uh, let me very quickly uh, address the, the, three, the two sets of questions. Uh, in terms of uh, support for uh, you know, the diaspora support for Africa. Um, it's already been mentioned, remittances is huge. In fact, the biggest inflow of foreign um, 
uh, resources in Africa is from the diaspora. It's not official development assistance and so on. Uh, the latest figures uh, seem to indicate is something like, you know, 50 to 60 billion dollars uh, of, of uh, remittances from the diaspora. Uh, I don't know any diasporan that who is a personal friend of mine or colleague who is not sending resources to the continent, supporting school fees, you know, for relative. So th there is a lot of support that comes from the diaspora. There are also, of course, other uh, types of engagements. Uh, you, you know, diasporans are beginning to set up businesses. Uh, and we all know about diasporans building houses, but but the one that I, I'm particularly fascinated is the you know the business uh, sector uh, that is attracting some diasporans. I remember attending a conference a few years ago at. Um, uh, a dia uh, Kenyan diaspora conference in, in Atlanta and the Minister of Finance and, and some key executives from Kenya were there and uh, they were talking about mobilizing diaspora capital, uh, you know, investment in the equity markets and, you know, no, and they were saying it's not enough or even important for you to build a house which nobody lives in but you invest your money in, in, in the economy that, that will generate uh, employment and so on and so forth and uh, uh, will also of course uh, generate uh, good dividends for you. So the, all sorts of engagement are taking place at the academic institutional level a lot of the aspirants are setting up institutions on the continent in fact the report details a lot of these institutions in science in the sciences in mathematics all over the place they're setting them up and you are also finding the aspirants who are doing joint for example Seboyoji uh, works up both at Princeton and in Nigeria he's actually vice chancellor uh, associate vice chancellor of research at some university in Nigeria and um, a number of uh, our colleagues, the Nigerian government has been very aggressive in recruiting the diaspora for, for leadership positions in some, um, in some Nigerian universities. So we are finding the contributions from remittances uh, to all sorts of uh, material, uh, intellectual, academic flows of resources and so on and so forth. And with regards to politics, uh, the diasporans, of course, play all sorts of different roles. Uh, they, and their roles are contradictory. You know, we should by no means assume the diaspora is always a positive force. Uh, in fact, in some of my work, I differentiate between three types of diasporas in terms of ideological terms. There, you know, one group, those of us who did studies in the 70s, used to talk of the comprador bourgeoisie. Uh, they are comprador uh, diasporans who essentially, they are there to sell, uh, you know, Africa to the West. You know, and they will say, you know, everything they do is really condemning Africa. You know, uh, you don't want those. Uh, and then you have the post-colonial critic type uh, who, you know, is, is interested in, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, 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 mediating the conversation intellectually between the two spaces. And then you have the progressives, uh, the Ngugi wa Thiongos and so on and so forth, uh, who, who, you know, are, are committed fundamentally uh, to the uh, struggles for emancipation, both in this country with Amer African Americans as well as on the continent uh, with others. And then when it comes to, uh, you know, their political role, um, I, di I did a long essay one time a couple of years ago on, on the role of African diasporas in conflicts, in African conflicts. And there you see, again, a triple role that the diasporans play. One, they, in some cases, they, they can be conflict, ge conflict generators or reinforce conflicts on the continent because they can mobilize resources. Uh, in ways that, you know, uh, uh, generate those conflicts. And then they can also be a very powerful forces for, conf uh, post -con uh, for conflict resolution. Again, you know, in all sorts of interesting ways. And finally, they can play a very important role in, in post-conflict reconstruction of those societies. So you see diasporans playing very contradictory roles, so we have to be mindful of that. Uh, with regards to the definition of the diaspora, I cannot agree with everything you said uh, more. Um, uh, the, this definition, or, or, or not definition, this focus on the African born was actually imposed by the project itself. My own work on the diaspora is much broader than what I talked about today. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, for the last uh, five, six, seven years, I've been conducting uh, a, a, a project on, on African diasporas worldwide. Uh, uh, for five years, I went to uh, 16 different countries around the world, uh, in South America, Brazil, uh, uh, Venezuela, um, 
you know, the Caribbean, Trinidad, and, and uh, you know, uh, Jamaica, Bahamas, you name it. And, of course, uh, North America, Canada, uh, the, the, the Mexico. People don't realize there is an African diaspora in Mexico. Uh, and then Europe, of course, you know, uh, Britain, France, Spain. Spain has a long history of African diasporas. Uh, and uh, Germany. Uh, and then Asia. India has a uh, has a has a, uh, a long history of African diasporas going back at least uh, 1,200 years, and I went into some remote parts of India and met these communities, which you know it, it, they would ha you would have that you know, surreptitious second when they are looking at me and they're looking at themselves. It's like, wait a minute, he looks like us, but he's not us. Uh, they're Hindus or Muslims or what have you. And uh, uh, I published a book uh, two years ago. Or, yeah, two years ago now, uh, called uh, In Search of African Diasporas, uh, which is a 600-page compendium of my experiences uh, in those 16 countries that I visited. So for me, the African diaspora goes back, in fact, over a very long period of time. And I divide them historically, I'm a historian, into different waves or different moments. Uh, when it came to, uh, and talking of the AU, uh, in, in 2004, uh, I was part of a group in Trinidad where the AU, uh, we met to discuss how to define the African diaspora. And, and if you, uh, you recall the definition of the African diaspora in the AU uh, documents, uh, it uses the word in historic memory populations that have dispersed out of Africa in historical memory. And, and that took us three days to get to that point of historical memory. And the reason was that um, we wanted to avoid talking, because everybody descends from Africa, dispersed from Africa. You know, if, we, if we go far enough, everybody's an African in that sense. So the question was, at what point do we have a cutoff? And, and the cutoff was historical memory. Because nobody who is an Asian today or uh, uh, um, who is, uh, you know, sort of a, 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 a European. Of course, they are African Europeans, but, you know, the indigenous Europeans, again, that's a very problematic term, uh, <laughs> who is, you know, they don't have any historic memory that they came from Africa uh, or documents and so on. So we use the historic memory to capture uh, communities that have been out of Africa um, uh, for at least the, the last several centuries, which would incorporate almost all uh, African descended populations in the Americas, very large chunks of those populations in Europe, and uh, some uh, of those populations in Asia are uh, not all, because some of the Asians, uh, Asian African descended populations go far back than uh, historic memory. Well, please join me in thanking Paul, for this exhaustive and profoundly illuminating talk. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. We need to, yeah, okay. Okay, all right, all right, yeah. So, uh, your, your attention, please. So, uh, our arrangements on, in this building, <laughs> 